Welcome, my friends, to the Sage Aquay Radio Hour, your home for free and critical thinking, and I'm your host, Mike Williams. Tonight, Oli Damagard returns to the show. As always, the discussion with Oli was wide-ranging and very insightful. And so, without further ado, here's the show with Oli Damagard. Oli, welcome back to the show. The last time you were on, we were censored and we were banned from YouTube, and I received a community guideline strike for us... Uh, just having an intelligent conversation and just discussing current events and giving our thoughts and insights on to, uh, into what is going on, possibly going on. So, but evidently intelligent adult conversation is not something that YouTube really aspires to. So we got kicked off. And uh, so I'm moving our shows and my other shows over to DTube and also as I always have the audio or the podcast version of it will go over to Mixcloud. Now, I know we want to talk about Florida, Austin, and the clues. And I just want to remind the audience, if you did not see or listen to the previous show with Oli, in that show, we had just gotten through the Florida event. And Oli had said that the clues that were left with that event we're pointing to Texas as possibly being the next target. And Oli said on or around March 18th. So on or around March 18th, we had these Austin bombings. The point being is, is that Oli's picking up on these clues is uh, certainly looking like what they are. They are breadcrumbs leading somebody who's paying attention to understand and know what's coming next. And I guess, Oli, this would be part of the whole karma aspect of this that you have discussed with us many times, especially on, on this show here. So with that, with that lead in, and to let everybody know, this show will, again, will be on DTube and Mixcloud so that uh, we avoid a YouTube strike. Because if that happens, then I won't be able to upload for, I think it's three months. So we're going to try to keep it as um, as much in a safe zone as we possibly can and get the word out. So Oli, with that, where would you like to start? I would like to ask you, what is the safe zone? If, if we get targeted, the reason why these uh, I'm I'm being targeted all over the place. I'm in for two strikes now, just uh, not for my own, but Matilda Macy, uh, yep. a, a comic that I'm supporting. Uh, what is uh, what are you not allowed to talk about? Because it's said that this is harassing and bullying, yes. and I'm like. Okay, <clears throat> that's the major question, and also um, who is behind YouTube because this is getting absolutely bizarre. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, if if, if you want to do videos that have to do with talking about hoes and bitches and and stuff like that, and you want to do videos where you're carrying your cat on a skateboard, and that's fine. Inane stuff that just dumbs down society is is perfectly okay. But if you want to talk about intelligent stuff and you want to try to get people to smarten up a little bit, that is completely off limits. And when I say a safe zone, what I mean is trying to navigate our way through this craziness and to continue to get the word out, but do it in a way so that we can continue to get the word out. Because, you know, they're, they're trying to shut you down and they're trying to shut me down. I personally think that I've mentioned to uh, some folks, and I think I said it in uh, a show or two, that... I think they have you targeted specifically. Uh, I do. <laughs> you know? I know what they yeah. have. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so yeah, so we, we're in a very crazy place. Yeah, but the thing is, the way I see it is like, this is fantastic because uh, if uh, we were just speaking absolute nonsense and just talking about things that had no meaning or importance at all, they wouldn't bother. Right. But these things, when they they can't even give specific reasons. Like I, I had a strike uh, and they just said, uh, and also a copyright thing. They just said, you have, you have broken some copyright rules. Uh, you need to accept this and obey and obey. I said, I wrote right back to them, said, absolutely not, no problem from at least uh, give me a chance to see what, what, 
image is it that I've used? What have I done? Right. But they, they didn't get back to me at all. But it was like, bend over, pull down your pants, mm -hmm. and we'll get on with it. And if you say anything, we'll just put a gun to your head. That's uh, But it's like this threat out of nowhere for... So you don't even get a chance to defend yourself or see what it is you're accused of. I just think that is this the behavior of somebody who's very calm and, and rational or is it the behavior of somebody that is freaking out and feeling that uh, they, they're panicking? Just like if you get, you know, like a, uh, some drug dealer get uh, busted and the whole SWAT team or whatever, the police is around the house. He freaks out. He starts uh, trying to stop and get rid of all type of evidence. And, and uh, w this is the type of behavior we, we're seeing here. They used to be able to do it from behind the shadows, you know, very so the subtle so that we couldn't feel, we couldn't really see what was going on, you know, a little here, a little there, stepping stones like David I talks about, yep. you know, so that we don't get, now it's this full speed ahead and burning burning and banning uh, books on Amazon. Amazon is right in their bed as well. Uh, just shutting down the one after the other. And and this thing with these YouTube channels, please be aware of it. They delete your account. It's not that, that you're, you still have access to it. It goes away. And so whatever you haven't backed up, it's gone maybe forever. Right. So, so we're looking at like a, a global dictator that is just – burning, destroying history. And uh, I, I want to point out that uh, over these 30 years, 30-odd uh, years, whatever it is, that I've been doing these things, I have collected an immense amount of material, all everything from documents, top-secret documents, uh, photos, maps, book, no, sorry, videos in the thousands, in the thousands. And what I've done is that... <clears throat> I've, uh, I've got it perfectly sorted in, uh, you know, like, so that whatever we talk about, I can check it beforehand. Whatever it takes me like seconds to get hold of it, the exact information, which is also why it's very hard to get to me. You know, they, they've tried to shut me down or, or find things that I said that wasn't correct so that they could hammer me and destroy me. Haven't been able to yet. And a lot of that is because I have a very good memory for these type of things, but also I have this, I call it my vault of, it's like a two and a half terabyte of um, uh, perfectly organized, uh, very s simple. And what I've done now, since this is getting really sort of uncomfortable, I offered people access to it, but paid access because uh, every everything that gets shut down for me is also a possible, uh, you know, I, I'm not paid by anyone. I, I do this on donation basis or selling books. And when, when the books get shut down, when the shows got shut down, when the, you know, so uh, anyone that is interesting, please look up my website, lightonconspiracies.com. Uh, there's my vault, uh, research vault. And for... Um, for a certain amount, I give the, then give people access to this. Some people think it's in uh, that it's uh, um, costly, that it's too expensive, but it's way low than lower than I've been advised from other people who have said that this this information, once they've seen it, it's priceless because it's it's thirty or five years of it's a library. Whatever case you want to go into, whatever, I mean, it, I have it. Yeah. So anyway, I just want to make people aware of it. Yeah, and you know the point you made before about them being very cryptic uh, about why it is that they're shutting us down. As an example, and I've explained this on some other shows with me, you get this community guideline strike. You're accused of bullying, harassing, and intimidating with no specifics whatsoever. And of course, we know that we weren't doing any of that stuff. Our shows are not about that. So this is what they levy on you. And they accuse you of falsehoods. And like you said, Oli, they give you absolutely no ability to really appeal. And so in my case, what happened was with our show, I get this community guideline strike, and then you, you get an email and you click appeal. And then they give you something like 200 to 250 characters 
to explain why it is that they should not have taken the video down and they should put it back up. Within 24 hours of me clicking that appeal, they sent me an email saying, nope, it's gone. We stand by our, our position. Now, there is no way, there's absolutely no way that anybody at YouTube sat there and listened to that show because it was a two-hour show. You know what they did was they got the appeal, and no matter what it is I said or how I structured the argument, it was going to get deleted. This is what they're doing. And you're right. They wouldn't be doing this stuff. If we were just talking a bunch of nonsense, they would just let us talk nonsense and look like a bunch of fools. But what's happening is we're not looking like a bunch of fools. Much of this stuff is coming home to roost now, and more and more people are starting to understand that something is very, very wrong with this world and something very, very wrong with the people who are controlling things. I think it's wonderful. It's like they <laughs> yeah, have I can to see show the smile their... on your face. <laughs> no, but it's like now they're showing their real face. You know, yeah. it's not a pretty face, but it's yep. coming forward. It used to be covered, you know, with makeup and a really mm -hmm. nice, fa nice facade. Now it's gloves up. Yeah. They, and just like you say, no sense. Of, there's no reasoning behind it because they don't have anything. They don't have anything they can nail on you. So it's like uh, just bring forward the shotguns and, and try to intimidate you into silence. Well, it's not really going to work. No, it's not going to work. I, I vow from my end it's not going to work. I'm not going to kowtow to their intimidation and their nonsense. Listen, I couldn't care less. Uh, you know, they're, they're shooting themselves in the foot. That's it. They're showing who they are. Yeah. And so the more they do that, the less I have to do it. So excellent. I, I don't mind. You know, I, I would very much prefer to do jam, do some jamming with you and spend some time <laughs> in the sun instead, you know, because this is getting, Pretty awful. Yeah, yeah. I always tell people that we have seriously. We do this stuff. It's not like oh, we love to do this stuff. That this is my first preference in life of something to do. There are other things that, quite honestly, we would find far more enjoyable to engage in. Right? Like you said, playing music or doing whatever. So we do this out of uh, you know a sense of at least with me a, a responsibility. You know, this is innate responsibility that you feel to pursue the truth and get it out there because you're seeing all of the, all of this deception, you're seeing all these lies, and, and you're just like, this is so wrong. This is so wrong, you know? So anyway, so where did you want to start with, with all of this? Did you want to start with Florida or someplace <laughs> else? See if we can get uh, this censored again? <laughs> well, I mean, since there's no logic to the censoring, I'm sure whatever we say, it will be nailed. Yeah. Uh, I would like to start with uh, showing what I believe is going on on, a, on different levels and also make connections that might sound bizarre if uh, people haven't looked into our earlier interviews or because over the years I've been pointing out the, 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 the I'm, I'm sort of like the dot connector and also the, the hidden clues that they always leave there, the, the type of hidden clues, the, it's almost like a secret language, what type of clues, and also the clues that are leading us to Austin. And Austin is really an interesting place because Austin, the University Tower of Austin, were the place for the absolute first mass shooting in U.S. history. And that was in 1966 on August 1st, I believe, where a, a young man, Charles Whitman, is said to have first killed his uh, wife and mother and then uh, brought up loads of guns up into this uh, tower of the university and then started shooting. I think he, he injured like 45 and he killed around 14. The numbers of the killed goes up and down, which I find extraordinary after all of these day, years that they, they, from day one, they had problems counting how many dead yep. and how many wounded. And it's, I think if you have bodies on the ground, that one is not breathing, that counts for one dead. That one is breathing, that's one wounded if there's something wrong with this individual. Another one not breathing, that's two. I mean, this is not super it doesn't require super intelligence. If there's no pulse, that is a deceased individual. Okay. So how can the numbers go up and down? Right. 
And so this whole thing, it's almost like it's taking us in, in a circular motion through time. And then we come back to Austin because it was after that first shooting, uh, where, uh, Charles Whitman got killed in the tower so that nobody could ask him or he could explain, which is the standard procedure after that. Many others, lone crazy guy, uh, alone because then no motive is needed. Uh, no, sorry. Then there's no conspiracy by law and crazy because then there's no, uh, there's no motive needed either. And it started right after that. We had this whole mental illness, uh, discussion going on that is still there to this very day. And it was after that event when the first SWAT team ever was created because that was the first time when violence could randomly hit anyone, which is the perfect fear factor. If you think of it, because it's one thing if you're guilty of something and then you can get hurt. But if it's just anyone anywhere at any time, including you and your children and your mother and whatever, your dog. Oh my God. Problem, reaction, solution. I need protection. Yeah. And you know what's interesting? That's 50 years ago too, right? So just for the audience to get a sense of how long the planning is in process, you know, where they start these things. And I've always said, Oli, that, you know, they're very, very patient uh, with their uh, incrementalizing the process of putting their agenda in place. So I just want to call out that what Oli's talking about took place over 50 years ago. So, you know, and we're still, we're still dealing with this stuff. If you look at the JFK assassination, I, I believe that uh, we've spoken about this many times, that that was a coup d'etat in slow motion, not even slow motion, but it was a coup d'etat of the Western world uh, and to a large extent the rest of the world also indirectly. And the forces, once they got rid of JFK, who was the last real elected president, even though there were some weird things going on in the Chicago district with the mob right. helping him get in position, after the Cuban uh, Missile Crisis, that is when he suddenly became from from having been this uh, sort of like glamorous playboy that and suddenly was in the White House. Yeehaw, lots of women and uh, and fun after the Cuban Missile Crisis, where he suddenly saw that, oh, my God, we almost started World War Three. Uh, and where he said and people were there uh, said that he was sitting there with tears in his eyes, just saying, I refuse to be the one that starts the Third World War. I refuse to be the one that do, do this to the world. And so from that point in history, you will see that he changed the direction totally. He said, I am going to sort this out. There is a way. And the way to do this is get sort of like defuse evil and deconstruct evil. And so, so what he did was he, he targeted all of these uh, dark forces that had tried to work its way up there. And that's why they got rid of him. Yep. After that, you will see that the whole thing takes a whole new dimension. Just like after World War II, you had OSS installed the CDC, which is also very central now with all of these, uh, uh, alleged uh, epidemics and viruses and so on. That was created at the same time as OSS after the Second World War with the export and import of Nazi scientists and so on. And also you had NASA at the same very t time, more or less the same time span, same people, key people involved, setting the whole scene for the next level. And th then over the years, uh, that just went from OSS into CIA, where they started doing mass uh, hypnosis, mass uh, propaganda, uh, involving all kinds of drugs, MK Ultra, multiple, multiple uh, coups, coup d'etats in multiple countries where they took over the Vietnam War. Many, many other wars were started of this by the same forces that have just continued into 9/11. And then onwards, and then after 9-11, more and more of these false flags started because they they felt like, okay, we need to deal with the U.S. as well on home ground, the backyard, totally get rid of the, the weapons. Also, one thing that they're doing now, I would suggest, is that they're trying to focus on the 
the mental illness as well, but not that they want to do something about it. What they want to say is that if you notice that every single time for I don't know how many times now with mass shootings or terror attacks, the police or FBI will say, well, we knew about him. He was under our radar. Uh, we had knowledge about him uh, and so on, but we didn't really think he was going to do something. And then he did. Oh, my God, what a bummer. Problem, reaction, solution. If that keeps repeating, well, the problem was that we already knew about him, but we didn't do anything about it. So what is the solution? The solution is to act before that individual do anything, does anything, meaning that we're getting into this uh, area of the minority report. You know, these things, when if you even think of anything, boom, they can take you. And how can anyone prove, just like YouTube now, how can anyone prove what you, Mike Williams, are up to? Have you been thinking about uh, doing a bank robbery today? We think you have. And boom. And they yep. can take you and put you in a silo or whatever. This is what they're trying to do. And so you will see this being repeated. Well, he was under our radar. Oh, such a pity. We should have done something, but we didn't. And now 144 people are dead. And we are to blame because we did not act straight away. That is the problem reaction solution. Be aware of that one. Yeah, it's interesting because a few weeks ago, Oli, uh, this is this whole like pre crime screening that you're talking about, minority report stuff. And, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, Trump had said that when he was asked about this whole thing with, uh, with guns and the violence and the shootings and all that stuff, he had said, well, I think we take the guns first. And then we deal with due process. Then we deal with rights and we deal with the courts. So you see where, you know, all this stuff is going. And recently, as of, I guess, about two days ago, they're actually talking about the Democratic Party. You know, we have the, the, the one party system, but for the purposes of having a, uh, an illusion, we have this two party deal. The Democrats are saying that we need to repeal the Second Amendment. So now they're openly talking about repealing the Second Amendment of the Constitution of the United States. Now, folks, they're talking about repealing a right. This is not a, uh, this is not something that they're, they're giving to you, allowing you to have. It's supposedly a right, which means you're born with it. It's inalienable. You can't take it away from you. It's like breathing, right? And so now they're openly talking about this. So, What's happening only, in my view, is they are right now balls to the wall. They are so blatant now with what it is that their agenda is and what they're going after and what it is they want to do that it's actually becoming an eye-opener for, for many, many people. And I'm talking about the people that were asleep. Now they're starting to wake up because one of the things I've always said to folks is that you will wake up when this rolls up on your doorstep. See, for the for the longest time, a lot of this stuff just happened and it didn't affect somebody. So they were just sat in their house and they said, well, this really doesn't affect me. So I don't really see why I need to say something or do anything. But now it's starting to roll up. There was an article also getting to the whole thing with prescription drugs in uh, one of the UK online newspapers. This is going back about three weeks ago where they said there was major research that was done that said that at least a million more Brits should be on antidepressants. So instead of understanding why it is people are depressed or why people are walking around with anxiety disorders, their solution is Medicaid. And that research came out and they're talking about, we're going to hand out more drugs. That's what they're saying. We're going to hand out more pharmaceuticals or we're going to ensure that at least a million more people in Britain are going to be drugged. It's absolutely insane. Well, can I say I don't eat I don't. medicine? I don't. I don't either. I don't eat. I, but... I don't touch the crap because yep. once you start to see the power structure behind these companies, it is like if if Al Capone was having a a, a chocolate factory, you know, and people were starting to feel very sick. Would you get? Would you be surprised, or would you start up? suspecting that dear Mr. Capone was putting stuff in it, you know, <laughs> right? and that there was a reason also if he was trying to intimidate anyone who didn't want to eat chocolate, you would start to sing, oh, come on, it's Al Capone. 
he he's doing things to people in this neighborhood i don't want to i don't want to join but just because it's nice people at least they look nice in white uh, uh, robes you know and doctor titles and with medical um, education backed by rockefeller and these type of individuals you think well i'll better take some more then right but it's like use use the normal logic, the Farmer Brown logic. I take these pills, I feel like crap. I take these pills, I become a zombie. I don't take these pills, I might be shaking for a while and then I start feeling good. I eat an orange, I love it. I eat vitamins, I love it. I move my body, I love it. What's the solution? It's just normal logic. Yes. They're trying to get the whole balance in nature out. They, they want to destroy the balance. They want to destroy your immune system. They want to destroy everything. So I think it's wonderful because like if they say we have to ban cinnamon, I say thank you so much. I'm really going to look into cinnamon. I didn't know that it was that important. You know, I'm, we're going to ban colloidal silver. Excellent. I'm really going to check that one out. Lemons are dangerous. I am going to go and check out lemons. They make it very easy. It's just that everything is upside down, inside yeah. out. Black is white and white is black. No, you're absolutely right. That's exactly what everybody should learn from this. Anytime they tell you not to look at something, you should look at it. Do you know with a baby, they say a, a baby does not understand the word not. Do not go there. They hear go there. Yeah. And we should just do the same thing. You know, be naive. They say, do not. Thank you. I'm going to. <laughs> and uh, and then go and check it out for ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's uh, unfortunately, though, only uh, there's not a whole lot of people that have awakened to that notion yet. You know, so when they tell them take more pills, they take more pills. We're coming to a breaking point where uh, or a tipping point where there are enough. People are waking and they're pushing this, pushing it so that even normal people, just like you say, it didn't matter to people before. But now it's it's sort of like people are pushed up into a corner where they start feeling it. Everybody starts feeling something is dead wrong here. Yeah. So they're doing us a favor. If they had the patience to keep on with their stepping stones, the, it would be so much harder for us. But now they're just moving forward like a, with a bulldozer. Well, I, I think it's because they're seeing their runway is very short. They don't have that long runway in front of them, you know. So they have, so they have a time frame. This is my opinion. They they have a time frame in which they feel they have to operate within, and there's like a goal line. They're looking at that goal line. I think what's happening is it keeps moving on them, because they're watching that goal line move away from them. It's becoming a little more elusive, and they're starting to get a little nervous about that. In fact, I think they're starting to get very nervous about that. And wonderful news. And I say, listen, as far as I know, it's just a matter of time before this whole thing will collapse or implode, or I'm totally wrong and we're dead screwed and we might as well roll over, roll over and die. But if I'm correct, then give it up. I mean, it's a crap game you're playing. You're doing it very poorly. And so it's boring the rest of us to tears. So give it up and join the rest of us instead of fighting us. You know, let the game be over. Well right. fought. Let the game be over. I'm, I am very tired for one. And I would very much like to jam with Mike. So bugger off and leave <laughs> us alone. Yeah. It's just so much easier to do the right thing, isn't it? And it, you just, it boggles your mind that we have to deal with all this stuff. It's so much time and energy just to think through all this negative, nasty stuff and for them to put it into play. And it's, it, it, it's, it's exhausting for us to have to analyze it and, and, and break it down and expose them. And it, God, if everybody would just behave themselves, it would just be so much better. <laughs> but Mike, my, my, can I ask you a question? Yeah. What, what is evil in the eye of an evil person? Yeah. No, it's not evil. It's the way they are. No, I'm asking. I'm curious. What is evil in the eye of an evil person? Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little story that it's very quick. A few years ago, several years ago, I was asked the question, why is it that good has such difficulty overcoming evil? This was an actual question that was asked to me by a person in the family. And I said, it's because 
evil knows no boundaries. So a good person has boundaries. A good person re looks at something and says, well, I'm not going there. I'm not going to do that. Whereas an evil person, the whole concept of boundaries does not come into play. All they could think about is their end game, service to self. This is what I want, and I'm going to get it regardless of what goes on around me. How much carnage is in the street? How many people get hurt by it? They don't care because they have no boundaries. So that's how I look at it. And this is why the good people who have boundaries have to understand this concept because good people think everybody has a boundary. That's what they believe. They believe everybody has a boundary, and that is not true. There are people that have no boundaries. And, and folks probably even know people in their own lives who don't have boundaries. And I'm not saying they're evil, but they're people that do things, and you're thinking, well, why did you do that? Right? So think, think of it that way, and then exponentially grow that, uh, that concept and apply it to the controllers who just simply do not care. They don't have any boundaries. I spoke to um, CIA whistleblower Chip Tatum once about these things, and I said, I really don't understand the way they think, they, the people who are carrying these things out. And he said, the only reason you don't get it is because you're not a pathological killer. If you were that, this would make absolute perfect sense to you. That's exactly right. That's right. So that's the comes down to the whole boundaries thing, right? You have boundaries. Yeah. You there are there were things that Oli and Mike would clearly never do, never say, and, and we would you know, we wouldn't know we wouldn't go there, but they do not operate that way. Very, very different, completely different page, a different mindset, a different reality. That's really what it comes down to. I have an amazing friend, uh, a former police officer in Sweden who was uh, more than 20 uh, years in, on duty, uh, fighting uh, organized crime in Stockholm and so on. And he's, he's a fantastic guy, totally fearless, always happy. And he can pick out a killer in any crowd, anywhere, he says. And so I was very curious, saying, you know, like, how can you, how can you do that? Uh, and he said, you can always spot a murderer. Because it is someone who has ta who has taken the decision already that I am willing to take a life if it's necessary. I have no problem. The decision has always already been made. Whereas a normal person would struggle with that thing. You know, there would there would be all of these things. He said you can see it in the eyes of these people. So so he many many times he he's also working as an Apache tracker. His name is uh, Kony Anderson. Very interesting guy. I I would uh, like to suggest you having him on on uh, your yeah, pro program like a great one day. Show. Yeah. yeah. And uh, no, I thought that was really interesting because once again the boundary there is no boundary. They just go. Yeah. And you got uh, Alistair Crowley, Crowley. All of you do do whatever you want. Yeah. Do as thou wilt. Yeah. Do it. You want it, do it. We have, I want it, I have to be considerate, I have to find a way without hurting other people, and then maybe I can accomplish it. They just do it. That's why you see Nike a lot in these uh, in these events, because what's their, what's their tagline? Just do it, right? Just do it. <laughs> I thought it was so interesting. I, I was going to come to that, because uh, there's a very interesting documentary about Osho, uh, the the um, guru that the, you know Osho uh, Sai Baba, no, not Sai Baba, sorry, uh, Osho, who came. He was an Indian guru who came to Oregon uh, years ago in the, I think in the 1780s, and they wanted to start a whole city there, and it became almost like uh, civil war. Um, and you know what the the one of the key opponents in this whole war in Oregon, out in the middle of nowhere, the one, the neighbor that fought Osho, was the founder of Nike. Oh, is that right? <laughs> in the middle of absolute nowhere, he had just they said that there was this lack of sh good running shoes, and he had taken iron in his uh, in his. Uh, basement, you know, taking an old pair of shoes and then with an iron, uh, you know, melted it and formed it into a good shoe. And boom, there you go. Nike was born. 
It's a very interesting documentary. And also, you know, all of these things, we keep finding the shoes everywhere. And more or less, always, it's the Nike shoe. Yeah. And around Osho, there's been a lot of suspicion about him maybe being a CIA operative, the whole, you know, in the same, just like with the rock scene, with the, all of these things, they tried to take over these organizations from the inside and control them, you know, the new age, oh, everything is beautiful. And <laughs> And we got you. Yeah. Religion, drugs, music, whatever area. And there's, I've just seen that there's a new book about Osho. He died uh, many years ago. And the cover of it is black and white. And uh, I can't remember the, the title of it. But what is on it? It's a black and white background and then a pair of Nike uh, shoes in magenta. Magenta, you know, the, we were talking about color codes. Yes. The deep purple, the deep purple and the magenta. These co I was like, are you kidding me there as well? So, and then the opponent being Nike, was that whole thing just a, and, and there's sort of other bizarre connections pointing to the Santa Barbara shooting as well. That maybe some of the people in this documentary were also part of the Santa Barbara hoax, but I'm not sure about that. I'm going to look into it more, but, uh, it's just going, it seems like it's going around in a circular mo movement, you know, like recycling of people, recycling of, of, uh, energies and funding and, and so on. Yeah. And now, I mean, with the whole Florida thing, right now we have, uh, teenage activists that are all over the place now, right? I mean, there yeah. are major media yeah. outlets that are doing talk shows and all this stuff, you know? And so. You know, folks have to take a look at that and you have to put that into perspective. You know, if somebody's 17, 18 years old, um, this is not real world stuff. Okay. There's a minor little problem as well. And that was that I predicted that shooting in December. So how can it be a, the work of a lone crazy guy if it was possible to predict it like three months before it happened? Right. Right. You know, because so. And I circled in the area on a map so that it's like the, the school is inside that circle. So I'll, I'll tell you how I found these clues because they're very bizarre, these clues. But I think I mentioned this in one of your earlier shows as well, that first there were, was the, the Freeman High School shooting. Uh, this is just I, I reverse. I, I think I predicted about 12 now precisely. Uh, but this one was another guy called uh, uh, Anaconda Malt Liquor. He pointed out that at the Freeman School shooting, which was an absolute hoax, uh, afterwards there were people gathered in a in a parking lot, uh, walking around, cell phones, smiling, you know, like t looking totally fine. And on the side of one of the women's uh, pants, it was a very big printed uh, name, Las Vegas on it. So he yes. went out. One month before that saying, I'm going to do, he's, he na labeled this uh, new verb, damaguarding. Uh, he said, I'm going to do some damaguarding and predict Las Vegas, possibly. I mean, we're guessing here. All of us are, but because we can't know for sure. Boom, Las Vegas happened. Then in Las Vegas, uh, there's more or less always one photo that is very critical, uh, that is uh, bizarre and somehow that is standing out, you know. And since 2014, I think it was, or 13, I, when I was informed the first time about these clues, I focused so much time, you know, as soon as something happened, I'm looking for the clues. Instead of listening to the official story, I'm just like, where are the clues? Where are the clues? Where are the clues? And so in the, Fort, in the Las Vegas shooting, there was this bizarre suicide photo of uh, uh, Stephen Paddock, the alleged shooter, where I mean, normally we're not shown anything uh, of uh, anything, no details whatsoever. And here it's a gruesome image of him lying on the back with his brains blown out. Uh, uh, you know, only problem is that officially he had the number 13 tattooed on his uh, neck here, but there's nothing there on the individual lying on the floor. Also, you can't see that it's Stephen Paddock or the guy they claimed did the shooting, which he absolutely did not. But on he's on the the carpet underneath him, which is a very 
ugly carpet to say the least. It looks very dirty and the pattern is bizarre, you know, like, uh, uh, just dark uh, yeah. lines on a gray back. I think it's very, very ugly. It's Not, very, very odd. Very odd for a luxury hotel to have carpet like that. But anyway, next to him, there's a lot of, of empty gun shells, and some of them on top of the pool of blood underneath his head, which I think is not correct because if he – at first he did all the uh, shooting with the automatic weapons, meaning that the gun – the empty shells is are from these weapons. Then he committed suicide with a revolver, meaning that the shell will stay inside the weapon, um, so that the shells would have been there when he fired and killed himself, meaning that th there should be blood on top of the shells. Instead, the shells are totally clean and placed, I would say, more or less on top of the blood. So, but what I saw was that with these lines next to the body, uh, there were some of the shells lying in a strange way. And when you look at it and you keep looking at it for a time, suddenly I and other researchers saw that it says FLL. And FLL is the, uh, what do you call it? The, uh, the letter combination for Fort Lauderdale, uh, the Fort Lauderdale airport yes. called Hollywood which I think it's a wonderful name, Hollywood, for these camps, but that's the name of the airport. So, and, and above these shells and the blood, there's like an arrow in the pattern of the, the carpet. So it almost said FLL and an arrow, where I felt, oh my God, could this be the one that could really be pointing to Fort Lauderdale, where there was another crap operation uh, of force flag attack uh, a year ago. 2016, where there was this, I'm sorry if I ramble, but there was this bizarre individual running around and his name was Santa Claus from Nome in Alaska. I mean, and he looked like Santa, uh, you know, the Santa as well. I remember that guy. Yeah. No, Santa Paul. Santa, Santa Paul, Paul was it. Right. Yeah. And so when I saw Santa Paul, I looked for all the Santa Pauls in Minneapolis and London and so on. Turn, then came the Melbourne car attack. And that took place right outside the St. Paul's Cathedral there, meaning that was the clue there. Then there, it took, it's a long story, but anyway, that connected them with the Westminster Bridge attack, which I predicted on your program one month to the day before it happened. Very precisely, Big Ben, Big Ben, Big Ben. Then came the Westminster Bridge attack right outside the Big Ben, exactly one month later, if you remember. So here, uh, when I was in the process of, of trying to figure out if there were more details in this photo of Stephen Paddock, a woman from Florida contacted me and said, have you noticed that the shape of the blood is exactly like one of the counties in Florida? And I was like, what? I had no idea, I had no idea. She pointed that out because she lives there. So I, I, com I checked it and it's more or less identical to the shape of that county. So I thought, FLL, an arrow, that county, that's enough for me. So I went out and said, please, please be aware. This was in December sometime. Please be aware the next one or one in the future could be within. And I made a circle around the area on the map. And then, boom, it happened here. And right away, there were very strange things with this shooting because it was at the Parkland School. Parkland Majory Stone Man's High School or something like that. And right. Parkland, for anyone who's, who knows anything about the Kennedy assassination, that is a word that just sort of like, uh, shouts out to you. Dallas, Dallas. Okay. Then there was the, the name of the alleged shooter was Cruz, Nicholas Cruz. And just a year or two ago, Donald Trump and other researchers were pointing towards Senator Ted Cruz from Texas, uh, saying, accusing his dad, dad Rafael Cruz, of being, <coughs> sorry, part of <coughs> the group that was together with uh, Lee Oswald in New Orleans before the Kennedy assassination, handing out leaflets, which he is. That is yes. the guy. And, and they even provided pictures of him standing there. Yep. Yeah, and Chauncey Holt, who was a CIA operative, 
who is uh, uh, in Dealey Plaza. He old tramp in all of these cards. He has uh, spoken openly for many years before he died in mysterious ways about his involvement he, in the JFK assassination. He didn't know about the assassination. He was there to deliver secret service badges to the people in the hit teams and so on. And uh, he said that he was uh, in uh, New Orleans that day as well. He is, when you see the photos when Rafael Cruz and Lee Oswell is in the middle, he's out to the right, kind of a short guy with dark uh, shades on. That's uh, Chauncey Holt. So he identified Rafael Cruz years ago, years ago. So I think, no doubt, Rafael Cruz was there. But there was Texas again through Rafael Cruz, uh, Te um, Senator Ted Cruz from Texas, Nicholas Cruz, Texas. Then there was one of the women <coughs> from the uh, Fort Lauderdale airport shooting one year ago. There were two women. There were two uh, outside the Parkland High School that said that they were, had also been at the Fort Lauderdale airport shooting one year earlier. And now they were there. Isn't it amazing? I mean, we've been in two, at the two of these places in, within one year and we managed to survive both. Isn't it amazing? And one of the people, one of these women were there with his, his her son, um, who survived the shooting and who was being interviewed, had this great type of uh, military shirt on and his name was Austin so I was like oh, whoop, whoop, Austin again so when when I uh, started sort of zooming in on Texas I thought there's always a drill if they're going to pull one of these off it, it's possible that they've even announced the drill in Houston, Austin Dallas, whatever so I found Dallas, Texas on uh, on Elm Street which is exactly the same street where Kennedy was shot, 1925 Elm Street, the Majestic Theater. They were going to have an, a mass um, emergency drill in Dallas. And as you remember, we pointed out many times before that the headquarters for these operations are almost always in libraries, public libraries, parking houses, or theaters. And here there was a theater within... Uh, very short distance to where Kennedy was shot. So you had all the emotional impact, Parkland Hospital involved, and the drill, everything there. So I felt well, enough for me, pumped out information to hundreds of radio stations and trying to diffuse this whole thing. <clears throat> also pointing out possible Houston, possible Austin, because there was another drill in Austin, no, sorry, in Houston on uh, the 3rd, March the 3rd. So what then happened was that <clears throat> a few weeks later, instead of Dallas, instead of Houston, it happened in Austin, this whole series of bombs. So I ask you, is it because the spotlight was aimed at Dallas? Is it because preparations were done in Houston and then that they redirected it? They changed it in lifetime, just like... Uh, which we spoke to, uh, about the crisis-solution.com where they got, they even got their own video showing how they can redirect and they had, can have multiple targets at the same time and redirect in in live time you know they can just redirect if any problem occur boom we take target 2 plan A plan B plan C <coughs> so is that what happened well the drill took place in Dallas anyway uh and But instead, we had this whole series of uh, bombs in Austin. But while this was going on, there was also a bridge that collapsed in Florida within the circle that I had made uh, to the, the International University of Florida, which is one of the campuses where the CIA had been recruiting for years and years, one of the major ones. Boom, that thing crashed in a very weird way. I've had architects look at it. They're like... We have no idea this should not be able to happen. Exactly. And then <clears throat> then there was another one, a woman. Uh, I think uh, she she had, um, uh, if it was gas or accelerated, some kind of uh, chemical stuff, and it's said to have driven straight into a school in the same area uh, of Florida. 
I would say diversion, diversion, don't look here, don't look here, don't look here. Then you have, um, while this was going on, there was a, the Great Mills shooting, uh, in Washington, or near Washington DC, not far from Washington DC, not far from Langley, not far from Charlottesville, where there was suddenly another shooting, where we're seeing, we see this uh, school building, it's a rainy day, absolute zero people, hundreds of police cars, and then they say, this has just happened. What are we seeing? We're seeing vehicles, blue lights, that's it. But then uh, uh, parents are told, don't come here, uh, you know, don't, nobody's allowed in, nobody's allowed out. And what was the name of the shooter? Austin. His name was Austin. So, but we go go back to Florida, and uh, what was very strange there as well with this uh, alleged shooting in Florida was that it was like this whole massive campaign was on standby, which I believe that it was. Boom, 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 shooting, 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 and suddenly this whole thing started with some key characters, one of them a young guy called David Hogg. Another one, uh, a young uh, woman called Emma Gonzalez, and there were two or three others where the slogans were ready, uh, banners were ready, the whole setup, <coughs> and all of them have been working either in in media as uh, journalists or in theater groups, uh, films. <coughs> they have some of them have very strange connections to the FBI. Homeland Security, crisis management. Uh, David Hogg was seen in a news uh, report that went viral, they say. I, I want to point out when somebody says, yeah. when somebody says that it went viral, what does that mean? It means that on YouTube, the numbers are, is it 10,000 or 100,000? I don't know, something like that. But whoever uh, controls the counter, on YouTube can put whatever number. I've seen the number of views go down on some videos. So there, I tell you, th there's manipulation going on here. So anything they want you to say, oh my God, that is, must be so important because two million people have seen it. Or somebody just put two million d -d 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 on a keyboard, enter, boom, viral. Anyway, so there was this uh, story that made absolute no sense <coughs> about somebody had put a surfing board on top of a, a barrel and there was some sand and a guard started arguing about it. Right in the, the beginning of that footage, the cam, camera zooms in or pans it like that and there's a, uh, there's a shoe right in the middle of it. The, the famous shoes, these business cards they leave and it, it makes no, no sense that a thing like that would go viral, even get on the news at all. And it was, that was in, in, in California. And then in California at the same time, more or less, there were also these very strange fires, uh, which I strongly would suggest were caused by directed energy weapons, a, a part of Agenda 21, only hitting buildings, only hitting certain areas totally cleansing these areas for people not wanted there. Uh, and one of these news footage that was taken there was in Sonora, California. And <clears throat> while the camera was focusing in on the rubble from one of these uh, buildings, there were two vaults in, in among the, the, you know, the burning fire and stuff like that. And these bank vaults said, Fort Knox. So I was like, what the hell was that? Two for, you know, Fort Knox. So I pointed out and said, please be aware the next possible could also be in Kentucky. Then there was the Kentucky shooting where a girl that looks a lot like uh, David Hogg, but with long hair. I mean, they've got almost identical facial structure. I would very much like to suggest, is it possible? that it could be David Hogg, and now he's got a haircut. Also, there's another individual that looks a lot like Emma Gonzalez, but with longer hair. Is it possible that she just shaved her hair off? They recycle, use the same people, 
and move on, which I've suggested many times with the, called the global tour of terror. You know, this, this unit that is moving around play, playing these things out. It also turns out that, uh, that, uh, David Hogg and Emma Gonzalez are actually cousins. It's the same family. And, but one thing that stood out was the name Hogg, which I find is, it's not a very nice name to have, I think, but, uh, uh, I mean, in the U.S., you you can be you can have all kinds of names, but I the name stood out, and I've never heard the name. And then I thought, yes, I have, because that Texas again. There was a, a governor in the 1890s. His name was Jim Hogg. He was called the the governor of the people. Very popular, at least the history books history book says that doesn't mean anything. But one of the things that he did was that he started a foundation called the Hogg Foundation. And what did they focus on? Mental illness. And where was their, where was their office that was in Austin? Where was the office in 1966? Where do you think the Hogg Foundation's office was located? I was going to say in Austin. In the tower. In the tower. Okay, so we're even more specific. <laughs> it was in the tower. Okay. Where he was shooting from, and then they were the ones afterwards going out, you know, like doing this whole propaganda thing about mental illness and how to mm. restrict the gun laws in 1966. Yeah. Okay. It, are these just coincidences, or uh, is something else going on? Yeah, I, I don't think they're coincidences, Oli. I mean, if you look at something one time, you might say it's a coincidence, but. It's like I said before, they have shown a lot of patience over many, many, many decades to put their agenda in place. I want to get back to a point just quickly you said about manipulating the views and stuff like that. And I just want to let folks know that Oli is absolutely right that these uh, outlets like YouTube, as an example, will pick them. They will manipulate views, which means it goes both ways. They can pump them up if they want something to really catch on or give the at least the impression that people are watching this and it's caught on. They can also take channels and videos and they can actually sit on and suppress the views. Now, the suppression of views has happened to me on YouTube and it has happened to me on and off on my blog. My blog is on Blogger, which is owned by Google. Okay. So what they've done to me, Oli, and they're doing it as we speak is I have a very large European audience. I have a lot of views that come out of the UK and out of France, along with the United States and Canada. And intermittently, what they will do is they will turn the blog's viewership off or significantly turn it down in Europe. This is what they do to me. So I can go from 5,000 views a day, they turn it down to about 1,500. And this is going on as you and I speak right now. This is what they're doing. And they go about it this way because it's impossible to prove. I can deduct that this is what's going on because I can look at the analytics and I can see where all of a sudden the blog is not being seen. And if I raise that flag, let's say I raise that flag with Google, I mean, and how do you even do that? Because Google is not a person, right? Google is just some shadowy organization. It's like we were talking about before with YouTube and the appeal process. Who are you appealing to? <laughs> some bot somewhere. And, uh, you know, even if you went to Google you and made your argument, they would just say, well, you know, it looks to us like just less people are looking at your blog, Mike. So, you know, stop whining and complaining. This is the game that they play. So I just want to make people understand that I have personal experience with them screwing around with my my media on YouTube and especially on my blog. So I just want to point that out. I can tell you that uh, every single time when I th felt that I made a major breakthrough here, I, that's happened a few times over the years, I just felt on this show – that was a massive, you know, you, you can feel it in your soul that that really made a difference. And I felt now I'm going to see the result in like traffic. I've always seen the exact opposite. It just totally slowed down. And the thing what they do, I don't know how they do it, uh, but one of the things they do, they filter it. They don't block it. 
Because if there's a blockage, you can prove it. You can say, ah, there's something wrong there. No, they filter it. It's sort of, so maybe 20% goes through. And, and I know, for instance, like when I test, I have to test the pay, uh, PayPal buttons and different functionality on a regular basis because they, they just stop working. And, and how is that possible? But they do. And so, and also they suddenly redirect to the wrong page. And so, so I'm totally sure that somebody is going in there and messing it up. And the way I see it, it's just like, okay, accept, adjust, accommodate, sort it out, sort it out, sort it out, sort it out. And, uh, but, but there is, it's also like with Cody Snodgrass, uh, the, the CIA whistleblower, I helped to step forward. He has also made some major shows. And like the sales of his books have gone down after he's made the big shows. How, yeah. how, how do you explain that? But that's just the way it is. They have a, a Twitter employee on uh, on tape. Uh, you know, he didn't know that. I guess that he was being uh, he was being taped saying that that Twitter engages in what they refer to as shadow banning. So what shadow banning means, my understanding is that you can post to Twitter, you can tweet things out, but then what they do is they significantly limit the audience that will actually see those tweets. So you'll see them because you're posting them, and because you post them and you see them on your Twitter page, you're thinking, I've tweeted something out, and it's going out to the masses. But what Twitter is doing is, on certain channels and certain individuals, they are making it appear that it's going out, but the only person that's going to see it is you and perhaps the people who are already subscribed to your Twitter channel. So anybody who would be new to Twitter or looking to subscribe to a new Twitter page, they're not seeing it. It's like you don't exist. So this is the stuff that they do. Do you know, I was, uh, I've was i been part of uh, helping Jim Fetz uh, uh, publish a whole series of books, uh, many of these, uh, anything from the Boston bombing to Sandy Hook to 9-11, JFK, Charlottesville, and, and so on. And <clears throat> we were doing a book uh, on 9-11. It's not him writing. It's like a uh, uh, combination of, of uh, many different researchers, 10 or 12 in each book, that are putting forward their uh, view and their work that they put together in these different cases. So they're very, very um, accurate and, and incredible books, I think, you know, historically important books. Uh, the um, Moon Rock Books is uh, the publisher. Anyway, we were doing one about 9-11, and I, I do the covers and the interior design. Sometimes I write a chapter as well. But there was one chapter I could not – every time I sent it to Jim, when the interior design, everything was set, I sent it to Jim, and he said, please, come on. Uh, you normally deliver good quality what's going on. Can you just uh, do it right? So I sent it back. He said, still the same. He was getting annoyed in the end because I sent it like eight, ten times. I can't remember, but it was a lot. And I was yeah. sitting totally confused saying, but so I took a screenshot and I sent it to him. And he said, that's exactly what I want. Please do it like that. And I said, I am. And the thing, what was interesting was that it was especially one chapter that kept getting messed up. And the, the, the name of the chapter was, Israel nuked uh, New York on 9-11. And the, t the two words that disappeared was Israel nuked. They just kept disappearing. And it was not only in the title. It was also, you know, on, on each page, there's the, the author and then the name of the chapter. So wherever you are in the book, you can see the name of the author and the name of the chapter. So, and it wasn't, it wasn't only in the main title. It was also in these up there, exactly these two words were gone. So I felt, okay, great. Now we know who's messing with us. And in the end, I had to send it. It was like there was this fil a filter or blockage doing that. I could not reach Jim. So I had to send it to somebody in Sweden, who sent it to somebody in Norway, who some sent it to somebody in England, who sent it to one of Jim's friends. And then he manually, more or less, delivered it to Jim Fetzer. And then we got the book printed. I had heard that Jim had gotten his uh, radio show canceled, too. Um, I received an email, I think it was from Sophia, and uh, she just you know, sent it off to me. And um, 
maybe it was a, a distribution list to show, you know, some more censoring. I guess the owner of the whatever network that Jim was on was saying that his his shows were too controversial. So I don't know if you know about that. And hopefully Jim is, you know, is back online you know, somewhere. But uh, I just point that out because that's just another example of what they're doing. I mean, even some of these other networks, radio networks that people are on, I mean, they're being pressured tremendously. Mm -hmm. And it does not surprise me that they omitted or deleted out Israel nuked. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's so obvious. I thought, couldn't you have done it been a little more clever and just delete some other words, but no, but I think it was an intimidation thing as well, you know, that they did it like that to intimidate. Yeah. They're watching, you know, they're watching. I have a, uh, Another person that I know who's been a guest on my show, Jack Hart, and, and, and he has told me that he has seen his emails edited. And I know Jack. I mean, he's not crazy. He's not he's not a crazy person. So, you know, and they do this, and a lot of times they'll do it. It's very subtle, not as blatant as what they did with you, but what I've noticed is it's subtle. And, you know, then you're reading your own email, and you're looking at it like, well, is, is that what I wrote? And then you go back and you take a look and then, you know, you start to see that somebody's screwing around with whatever it is that you're trying to send off. I'm not going to make people paranoid, but I'm, I'm going to give you another one as well, which took me some time. Is that, is that okay? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I had this bizarre experience, you know, my website was being attacked from right, left and center until I got under the umbrella of Chip Tatum. After that, boom, nothing happened. My website had just been fine, doing great. But uh, on on a personal level, I had like uh, external hard drives where I made backups of everything and tried to keep sort of on a regular basis uh, backups. And then sometimes things just disappeared from my computer. I was like, I, n I don't get it. It was here. It was, I, I mean, it was just gone. And so I thought, but thank God that I got a got it on a backup as well, or two. And so I put it on in the backup, it was gone from the backup as well. And it was not only one backup, but it was several. I thought, am I totally crazy here or what is going on? And but what I think the way they do it, they go in the back through the back door into your computer, and I believe that uh I'm just seeing the logic in the whole thing. Uh the way they would do it, it put in like a little terminator, like a, a time bomb in whatever file that they want deleted, you know, and then they just leave it there with a timer. Uh, and then on a specific time and date, it just terminates that uh, folder. It just deletes it. It's like a virus. Yeah, exactly. And then if I made backups of those files, then as soon as I connect the backup, the timer says, oh, it's over time, boom, and it, del it deletes the backup as well. Yep. That makes perfect sense, Oli. That, that's the only way I can – either I'm crazy or somebody has been doing this. It's not only once, and since I've got everything organized, it's like very frustrating when suddenly it's just gone. Yeah. And uh, anyway, I want to come into another area. Go ahead. Because I think that there are some strange, other strange things going on as well, where, um, do you know, you have the Batman shooting, the Aurora shooting. Yes. Okay. Then there was a shooting on the strip in Las Vegas by the Joker. Yes. Not the mass shooting, uh, the latest one, one earlier one. Then there was a bus uh, thing outside a courthouse in England where it said that a, a man was run over by a bus, but that the filming is very bizarre. And Spider-Man is there in an outfit. In the crowd, Spider-Man is there. Then you have the Times Square attack, where you got different uh, uh, Disney characters running around in the crowd. So, okay. Then you have the D Darth Vader uh, school stabbing in Sweden. He was dressed in a Darth Vader outfit. Then you had the Robocop uh, attack in Melbourne. I can you see we're starting to see a bizarre pattern here. I think. Then, uh, at the Bataclan uh, massacre, where I've been on location, I I hope I exposed it 
very well in showing that the official story, absolutely not true. Absolutely not true. And there was uh, the guy that is claimed, uh, I think his name was Salam Abdel Salam, uh, if I remember right. There's so many. That sounds names. about right. Yeah. yeah. And this individual, I found him, uh, he was the most wanted guy in Europe. And I found him on photos on location after the whole thing happened. He's walking around in the crowd. There's one, uh, I think it's Sky News that are doing a, a, a thing and they filmed in the street. Uh, and I've been on location, so I know exactly where they filmed it and so on. And it's outside the Attitude Cafe in Paris, just a few hundred meters from where these shootings are said to have taken place. And if you were the most uh, wanted guy in Europe, I would sort of suggest keep a low profile or put a wig on, some sunglasses, whatever. When when Sky News are filming this whole thing, they're just, uh, you know, filming uh, the static camera, people walking in the street. And then suddenly this guy, if you don't know who he is, you wouldn't notice him, is crossing the street looking into the camera, smiling. That's the guy, Salam Abdel Salam. Okay, that is the guy, the most wanted guy in Europe, filmed by Sky News, days after it happened, is it, I mean, really? I don't yeah. think. And I've even walked the same payment, uh, being filmed, smiling into the camera, I, because I tried to track down these things and walk in their exact footsteps and so on. But, he then disappeared. There was this whole manhunt going on in Paris and or France and Belgium and the people got blown up that later turned out to be alive and so and the brother of uh, Salam uh, his name was uh, Brahim not Ibrahim but Brahim and he blew himself up in a cafe uh, because I know that because it was filmed so I know for sure that that was true. Only problem is that he disintegrates I mean, he's got like a suicide bombing bomber vest on. He walks in and it explodes and he disappears. And it's amazing because a massive explosion that can just turn him into dust doesn't even turn over the vases or anything on the other, on the, on the tables around him. Okay. So I would suggest absolute fake, fake, fake. Okay, so the picture of Brahim always, I just always felt there's something wrong. I know that face, but it's not really him, but I know him. And I've been looking for for a long time, and I found it yesterday. Uh, it's an actor called John Torturo, who has been, he was in the big, uh, what is the name, the big Lebowski? No, the big. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah, I don't remember the movie, but I know the name. Yeah, yeah he's been in many films, you know, like uh, Mafia. Uh, he's he hasn't had so many main parts, I don't think, but many um, minor parts in many of yeah, the big the actor stuff. Yeah, yeah, but big movies, and these two guys are almost identical. I am not saying that John has taken part of this at all. I'm saying a psyop. Know, you you use so you you affect your subconscious thinking. That guy, I've, he was part of the mob. I think in the Big Lebowski, he he's a pedophile as well, or something like that. You know, so your subconscious on some level will say, "Yeah, that guy." Then you have Emma Gonzalez. Uh, now after the shooting in Florida, she dresses in military uh, colors and haircut like uh, what do you call it uh yeah buzz cut buzz cut very short you take gi jane with demi moore put yeah. them next to each other very very they look a lot alike i mean absolutely not identical i'm talking on a subconscious uh level then you have there's another of these girls. There's David Hogg, Emma Gonzalez, and then there's this girl with very big black glasses like that. And she looks a lot, not identical, but the glasses and her, her sort of appearance at least says, uh, Velma in Snoopy Do in, um, Scooby Doo. Scooby Doo, except 
Scooby Doo. Yeah. So I'm I'm thinking, you know, like Batman, the Joker, the Spider Man, Thelma. I know exactly where you're going with this. My view is they are blurring the lines between reality and fantasy. And so they are tying it back to movies and, and cartoon characters and comic book characters. And they're just it's just been a big blur now, trying to make it more and more difficult for people to be able to discern between reality and the cartoon world. And it also enables them to be able to uh, to social engineer and to do predictive programming through their outlets like Hollywood and television to be able to push their agenda forward. I mean, that's what I see going on. So I, mean, I don't know if that's where you were going. I, I think you were, but that's what I'm seeing. Like Batman, Spider-Man, Joker. Give me a break. And it's being repeated that. And then you've got the color coding. Yeah. Uh, you got the shoes. Uh, I think now when uh, – did you see after Florida – that they put 14,000 shoes outside the uh, the government buildings in Washington, 14,000, because they say that's the number, 7,000 are the numbers of killed kids in the U.S. I've looked into a lot of false flags. I, w I, can't, I can't get it up to 7,000 anywhere near it, even if I believed all of them. No. And then, then you got, like, not only are they, uh, like, normal shoes – now some photos, they're baby shoes, you know, so yep. that, so they go emotional. Oh, isn't that, that's horrible, these little babies. No, yep. they're supposed to be teenagers or up in their 20s. And w so what's going on? And so many, I tell you, there are so many areas where I see these shoes appear. In, in news, uh, normal media, when they're sort of on a crime scene, um, they say, oh, there was a big fight outside a pub, uh, you know, and two people got stabbed. What is right in the middle of the, the street? A shoe. One shoe. A shoe. There's like a shooting, drive-by shooting, a shoe in the street. There was this horrible accident, uh, you know, a shoe in the street. There was a terror attack, shoes in the street. There were an, um, a bus that turned over and killed some school children, a shoe in the street. I really think... You know, follow the shoes. Yeah, and the shoes, folks, just so, you know, to remind you, is Masonic, pre-Masonic symbolism. So just so everybody knows. It is one shoe off means that the individual who's there without one shoe is taking part of it voluntarily in this ritual or whatever you want to call it. And two shoes off is uh, homage to the sacred space, the sacred place for this ritual. This I've had from insiders in the Masonic world. So it's, it's just that I think it's quite clever because when you think of it, many of these operations are on a need-to-know basis. It's very important that as few people as possible know about what's going on. At the same time, if you're in the uh, chosen few and you uh, need to communicate, but it's so important that nothing can be traced back to you, no paper trail, no emails, look what happened to Podesta and Hillary, all of these things, no emails, no phone calls that can be tapped, no, no. how do you communicate? If you have decided colors or symbols, then it's super simple. It's super simple. You don't need to do anything. You just sit there with your big fat cigar on some tropical island maybe, uh, right. being part of this whole thing through uh, crisis simulations where like uh, uh, crisis-solutions.com is suggesting you can sit anywhere as long as you've got internet access and be part of are carrying these simulations out. Uh, so you sit there, you have no idea, but when you go through the news, you just sat through the TV channels or you look in the paper, there's another one of ours, there's another one, there's another one. And I think it, it works in different ways as well. I think that uh, the people in the receiving end, for instance, like something happens in Florida. The governor of Florida doesn't have to have known about it before, but one boom, oh my God, it's here. He knows the force behind it. He doesn't know the details. He knows his part, 
like he gets activated. Now I have to go out and say, oh, we would, you know, a sympathy for the fam victim, right. families of the victims and so on. So what he does is he sends the signal back by wearing, for instance, a deep purple tie saying, I'm in, I'm yours, I'm doing my part. And the colors that uh, I found being repeated often, often, often are deep purple. And they talk about the, the purple revolution, George Soros purple revolution and orange. And uh, orange, uh, I've been informed, I don't know if it's true, but orange is the color of uh, death to come. I mean, uh, that is approaching death that is approaching. Well, orange also in uh, numerology, Pythagorean numerology, uh, totals to 33, so to 33 degrees of Freemasonry. So that's another reason why they use orange. There are many, many names uh, that uh, when when you go through the uh, also the what is, what is this the geometric? No, it's uh, called uh, uh, numerology, geometria. Yeah, geometria. When you put the names in of victims, of police officers, or whatever. Right. It comes down to 33. The, the license numbers on the cars on location, the ambulances, the cars that, that have been shut up or blown to pieces, 33, 33, 33, repeatedly, not only in the U.S., but in Europe as well. Well, I try to, uh, to tell folks that um, to, to look at the numbers. That's the one thing I look at is I look at the numbers. Look at the, the time stamps also of articles and the dates uh, the number of people that have been injured or allegedly killed and stuff like that. When you start looking at those numbers, they are all occulted numbers. Three, six, 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 triple six, seven, double sevens, triple sevens, eight, eighty eight, thirty three. So th these numbers are always, always there. And to me, that's, you know, that's their calling card right there. And that's the first thing I do, Oli, when I see these events is I, I look at the numbers and I could – that's a very good indicator. I think an excellent indicator to understand whether this is real or not. I mean that's how I do it. At least say it's it should wake you up to like, whoa, hang yes. on. Something could be wrong here. Like for instance, there's this uh, um, Russian um, spy that is said to have been poisoned together with his uh, daughter in the UK recently uh, by Novichok or what they, I think the poison is called Nov Novichok, <clears throat> and he he's 66. His daughter that was poisoned is 33, and uh, you know so you got 30, 66 and 33 within this very same sentence. This is just one thing that that makes me go like, whoa, hang on, I have to look into this before I believe it. I also think it's like they say that uh, the KGB poisoned them, and so they used uh, a poison that could only be traced back to Russia, KGB. Would they do that? I mean, would you do a thing like that? To, I mean, that is to sort of point straight at yourself. I don't think so. That is a way of setting somebody up. Yeah, it's it's all it's it's all very interesting, you know. It's um, their way of going about you know, planning and executing these things, and all of their little symbols and their calling cards and the such. You know, this is the thing. It, the vast majority of the folks don't know anything about this stuff, and this is what's so wicked about what they do. Um, and they know this. They know people. They refer to us as profane. That's P-R-O-F-A-N-E, folks, profane, which means you are unknowing, that you are not worthy of the knowing or the information that they have um, and the knowledge that they have. So, you know, the cards are stacked against the population. And they utilize their knowledge of the occult and the knowledge of it goes back to the mystery religions. You know, they've bastardized it. There's no doubt about it. Manly P. Hall talks about this in his book, uh, The Secret Teachings of uh, of All Ages. He talks about the fact that they've taken divine magic and they've created sorcery and black magic out of it. So this is what's going on, you know. And that's why when people, when you talk about the fact that they were engaged in black magic, uh, people scoff at that. Like, oh, that's ridiculous, you know. They're not walking around in witches' hats and stuff like that. And but that's the thing. That's that they don't walk around that way, you know. They they play the exact opposite 
where they look appealing to you, right? They're dressed nice, they got their suits on, well-spoken, they've got their pundits on TV and so on. It's a whole presentation that's done so that it's appealing to you, so that you get drawn in, you, you, know, you get lured into the game. And this is what they do. They, they pull you in and then they, they make you believe their lies and they want to make you believe their deception. Because if you buy into it and you believe it, then you have given your consent to anything else that they have planned, either currently in process or in the future. It's implied consent because you're not pushing back. You're not saying, hey, wait a minute. You're, you're buying into it. You're agreeing to it. Yeah, and that's why they do what they do. That's why their, their whole objective is 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 days a year is to manipulate your mind. It's to manipulate the masses and steer them in a certain direction because that steering is consent. You are agreeing whether you know it or not to what it is that they're putting in play. I think it's super interesting what you're saying because it is only through our consent that they can carry on these things. They need it. They need it. If we just say we don't even have to go violent or anything, if we say, nope, nope, right. this is not okay with me, if enough of us say that, it stops. Right. That's the thing. Like if they pulled off, if they tried to pull off an event, let's just say, right, let's just use this as an example. And the only people standing there were the, were the people who are part of the engineering of the event. And the masses themselves stepped back and said, oh, no, we're not buying into this. They are exposed immediately, immediately. So they need an audience. They need an audience in order to make it believable and to pull it off. And that's it's very key, Oli, what you just said. We, as a population, we as humanity have to step back and say, uh-uh, we're not buying into this anymore. Because once we do that, then it's like the king has no clothes. And that is exactly what I'm aiming for. You know, totally nonviolent, just snap out of it, see it for what it is, and it will stop. That's right. It's if, if David Copperfield was performing a one or a three trick show or something like that. That was just blowing the whole world up. If suddenly somebody showed exactly how he did it, in that second, when the masses understood, oh, he's not doing it with his right arm, he's doing it with that, nobody would look at him. Nobody would give him any power. They would just turn their back, laugh, and go home and start uh, getting on with their life. Right. Why waste my time? Right. Why give it power? And here we are giving it so much power. And I also think there's a danger focusing so much on these things and feeling the things we do of terror, uh, all of the fear that, that is uh, these things amplify your intentions, your thoughts, your your direction in life in a very negative way if you're not aware of it. That's why I personally try to, something happens, I don't go into it emotionally. I detach. I, you know, I, I'm not going to give them any power. I detach and then I really look into it while being very grateful for my life, enjoying my life while digging into this heavy, heavy crap. And, yeah. but, because the more we, the more energy we give it and the more emotion, I think the emotions are very, very important. Good emotions are bad emotions. Whatever we charge it with, it's like an, it's like a magnet that pulls it in, that amplifies the whole thing. And they, the dark forces are very aware of that as well. That's why they keep stirring and stirring it and why they need, they use, if you listen to the, to the news, it's dead boring again. If you if you don't know what trigger words are, you it's so easy. Like why if you write something a novel or something like that, you variate the words. You you play with words. You you paint with words. Here it's the same. Terror, terror, terror attack. Fear, terror, terror. It's the same, the same, the same. It's like a a dagger just being jabbed into your back all the time, or or an ice 
poke, you know, right into your brain, just boom, boom, hammer it in, hammer it in, hammer it in. It's hypnosis. What they're doing is also suggestions, right? So they they have words. You're exactly right, Oli. These are trigger words. These are uh, post-hypnotic suggestions. So they're, they are putting words out like terror, shooting, crisis, tragedy. And they keep repeating it over and over and over and over again. And not only do they continue to repeat the wording, both in verbally and in text, but then they lay it up against imagery. Mm. They keep showing you the same clip. You and I talked about this before, right? They keep showing you the same tape loop over and over and over again. So in hypnosis, what's happening is the mind loves imagery, loves it. So when you're sitting in front of the television, you automatically go into what's referred to as an alpha state. That's a trance state. It's the first level of trance below beta. Beta is your conscious state, you know, your, your waking state. When you watch television, you go into a trance state, a light trance state. When you're in a light trance state, you are apt to become hypnotized, uh, especially when you're watching something for very long periods of time, and they keep, continue to show you the same imagery over and over and over again, and they continue to repeat the words that are they want you to associate with that imagery. So then you walk away. And what's happening is you don't even realize it. You don't even realize now that you have just been programmed to associate those words with that imagery and that event. That's it. Now they've got you. And people who sit in front of their televisions all day long, watching cable news networks and taking this stuff in incessantly, that's what's happening. You're being programmed. Okay, take it from me. That's what I do for a living. I'm a hypnotherapist. Okay, so I know something about hypnosis. You're being programmed. I so, I sometimes call it to marinate the brain. You know, they they put exactly. it in marinate, <laughs> and it just good. sucks it in without you knowing it. Uh, yep. And then you li you're lying there sleeping, and all the dreams are, rrr, rrr, and you wake up like already affected. And then the first thing you do is put on the news another mass shooting. Oh my God. The thing is, yeah. if you ask me, we live in a beautiful world. It's yes. so beautiful, so peaceful, so wonderful. But then as soon as I turn on the internet or a TV or a radio, it's just <laughs> boom, boom, boom. They start all over again. Yeah, it's a small minority of people who are trying to convince the world that this is an evil, wicked place. And it's only evil and wicked because there are evil, wicked people that are currently in a position of controlling. And you're at, you're exactly right, Oli. You know, when I watch the news or I watch television, I always think to myself, which I don't watch very often at all, but I think to myself, does anything good ever happen in the world? <laughs> right? I mean, does, do we ever see anything where somebody saves somebody or people are doing good things for other people? Uh, helping each other out. Do we ever see anything that has to do with uh, communities coming together and, and growing food? Or We never see that. We never, ever see good stuff. So the thing is, people are watching this, and you never see anything good coming out of the television. It's always, like you said, it's some kind of shooting. It's violence. It is uh, television shows that want to glorify the police state and the militarization of, of society. This is what people are seeing. You know, shows that have to do with courtrooms where you're being judged, right? <laughs> you're a bad person where we're judging you. So, folks, you have to get your heads wrapped around the fact that this is this is what's going on. This is what they're doing. And the biggest problem that I see, Oli, is human beings by their very nature are very trusting. Mm. They, they, they want to trust. They, people don't want to walk around believing that people are lying to them all the time. I mean, I don't want to walk around like that. So you're trusting and just... As an example, I don't want to digress too too much here because Oli's the guest and I'm I'm supposed to be the host. <laughs> is um, I'm happy to listen. Even within your family, right? Like family and friends, you trust. You want to trust. And then what happens is maybe somebody in your family or some, one of your friends does something that breaches that trust. And what happens? You become very despondent about that. Well, how could you do that? Or how could you do that to me? Why would you say that? I don't understand, right? And the reason why you have that reaction is because you want to trust and you want people to trust you you want to trust them and so you have that implied foundation that's in place to begin with and so the controllers know this and they know that we're very trusting beings by our very nature and so 
they exploit that trust. And that's why people say, well, why would they lie to us about this? Are you saying that they orchestrated and engineered a shooting? What they, that's ridiculous. They would do, why would they do this? They wouldn't hurt us. They wouldn't lie to us. They are, but the human automatic response, which is to trust, kicks into play. And that's what creates pushback where people don't want to believe or even entertain the stuff that like you and I and many others are talking about. I think it's beautiful that people trust though. It's just that you have to understand that the, these forces are not very nice and they will take advantage. I mean, I, I have been very naive in my life. I, I'm a proud, naive, what do you call it? I'm a proud, naive person who have, <laughs> who have been uh, fooled more than once. But I, I like that at the same time. I like f thinking good about people. I like uh, uh, being until somebody it's proven to me, then until then, I will trust them. But I'm, I will keep my mind open, though. And I, I would suggest again, if you see somebody that has repeatedly turned out to be lying to you, like mainstream media, for instance, then it's not a matter of being, uh, you know, to to be the good thing about believing things. Then it's plain stupid. And then you have to sort of wake up to the fact that, hang on, if they lied about that and 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 that, and now they're saying this, maybe I should doubt it or maybe I should look into it before I trust this source that has turned out to be right. absolute BS for so many, many years. But it's a, it is a painful experience, but it, it is a mandatory thing as well. So I would suggest painful or not painful, it could be a very good step forward. If you're not aware at this point, then start looking into things or at least doubt them. Question. I question everything. It's like my sweetheart here. She comes and says, Oh, I heard this on the radio, you know, that 4,000 children have been killed in Greece and, and the bodies are on the beach and people are, you know, like, and I say, my God, that's awful. If it's true, right. she gets so annoyed because I say, if it's true, do you, have you been there? Have you seen it? Have you, do you know, like, let me call someone. Where did you say it was in Greece? Okay, I'll see. I'll take the phone book. I'll, anyone in that area, I'll call. You know, I've done things yeah. like that before. I call at people in the area saying, the Ebola virus, there's like 4,000 dead people in your area. And they say, what? You have officially 4,000 dead people in it. There's this horrific epidemic going on in Ghana in your, the area where you live. They say, and the, when I've done that, it's always been, no, the, the virus, th that is in, in Colombia. And if I'm sure if you call Colombia, they would say, no, no, it's in Eastern Asia. And in Eastern Asia, it's always over there, far away over there, so you can't check it out. Yeah, people, they don't believe that. They just make up stories. And I know it is hard to believe because it goes back to, you know, you want to trust. And I think, like you said, Oli, trust is a beautiful thing, but you also have to have discernment. And as you have also said that once you understand that you have been lied to multiple times by a certain person or a certain entity or organization, discernment has to kick in. You have to, and you have to say to yourself, okay, well, you know, I want to trust you, but you have shown to be untrustworthy in the, in the past. So I'm going to just listen and have to be objective about this. And, uh, I'm going to take a closer look at it. There was an individual called David Atlee Phillips. He was uh, the chief of the Western Hemisphere for COVID operation. He was also the handler of Lee Harvey Oswald, the station chief in Mexico City at the JFK assassination, one of the architects of the assassination. He said more than once that he could kill more people with his typewriter than any smaller army as far as I know, or something similar to that uh, extent, that with the typewriter, with these words, and then you look at NSA, all of these different intelligence agencies and so on, you got the Swedish secret police with massive budgets. What are they doing? Where are they? You never see them. What are they up to? One of the yeah. things 
they're infiltrating, they're manipulating. That is one of the ways they do it. So just because it's in the news, or specifically, I mean, thank God they keep it in certain areas like mainstream uh, magazines and, and news stories and so on. You can Then you can start studying it, you know, that, okay, so you're going to get me. How are you trying to get me? Let me listen for keywords. Let me look for other things being repeated on a daily basis. You know, start seeing the patterns. How are they trying to do it? It's quite interesting once you once you get an uh, an interest for it. It is quite interesting. It's it's very uh, complex and it's very intricate. It, like I've mentioned on many shows, when I talk about the music industry as an example, like Mark Devlin and I talk about this a lot and uh, we talk about how the music industry is being used and has been used for many, many, many years, for decades and decades as a social engineering tool. You know, they're, the number of tools they have in their toolbox to go at the masses to manipulate them and to steer consciousness is incredible. And their understanding of the human psychology is also incredibly advanced, way, way, way beyond what most people would even just think it would be. So it is. It, it's. It's. Um. It, it comes down to. Um, it's actually very interesting. Even though it's. It's. It's wicked. What they're doing. It is a very interesting study, in uh, in how they go about doing what they do. Uh, and, and that's why I always find this stuff very intriguing. And I guess that's one of the reasons why. You know, I continue to uh, to pursue it and talk about it is because, well, first we want to get the truth out, but the other thing is, it's it's it is very interesting to study. Yeah, I agree, because with everything, I think whatever you learn, you can use it for good and you can use it for bad, and they have put yeah. in such an effort into studying so many different areas that we, the normal people, have not looked into. So maybe once this whole thing is transcended. A lot of these things that they have uh, found out can be used for the good of humankind. That's right. So, Oli, with the, uh, were there any clues that you became aware of with the whole like Austin bombing thing, or is that something that you're still studying? I'm, I'm a bit on my knees at the moment. I've been sick for a while here, and uh, oh, okay. and also I get exhausted because it's like the same again, again, again. So I have not uh, found anything, but what I have seen is uh, uh, there are two more drills, uh, two more upcoming drills in Dallas in uh, April here. And so I really think that uh, just because it didn't happen on the 18th, sometimes uh, they saw they take a step back, they wait, and boom, they hit just like they did with the first one I ever predicted in Copenhagen, I predicted on the 14th of January, it happened on the 14th of February instead, on the exact hour. So uh, I would not, uh, uh, you know, I would still keep a close eye on Dallas. And also this whole, uh, I think it will be very interesting to look into more around this Hog um, Institute. And I also want to point one final thing out. Do you know in, in Charlottesville, do you remember when the car crashed into the crowd? Yeah. Then it reversed uh, away. The whole thing was a staged event with uh, what do you call these guys that uh, hit by cars and they fly off mountains and stuff like that? Oh, like uh, stuntmen. Stuntmen. So this thing in Charlottesville was uh, done, uh, among other things, with stuntmen when this car crash was uh, arranged. And <clears throat> the thing was... Uh, if you remember, when the car reversed away, we didn't see uh, the connection from the impact. And then when the car reversed and disappeared away, they were sort of like different angles, different cameras. But it's it's made to look like it was the same car. And the car reversed with the bumper uh, falling off, even though the bumper was connected with a steel wire. And the, thing, the last thing we saw was that the car... Uh, when it uh, passed uh, an open space, uh, a, a street crossing, was that it? Le the f there was a, a shoe that fell out, a red shoe that fell out right in the center of this the street crossing. A red shoe. Can you believe it? The trainer. Okay. So exactly when these things happen, we have to be aware what else is in the image. 
And right above the car, when this happens, there's a, uh, a shop window, and the shop window is called the impeccable pig. And now we have this ho this whole hog thing, uh, and the impeccable pig is a chain of store stores that I, as far as uh, been able to find out, are from Texas. So if it was only that one, but there are other stage photos of very clearly stage photos from Charlottesville, where you got like the, the opponents and photographers in the middle, the whole thing looks very staged and right above it in the center of the image, the impeccable pig. So I think that, uh, could also be one of these future of uh, pointers to future operations, which would then be, um, in Florida, once again, the way that they connect these things, you know, and that, uh, that location where that shop is, is just a hundred meters from a hundred yards from the Masonic Lodge in Charlottesville as well. So maybe coincidences, but when there are so many of them, I think it starts making a very clear pattern. Yeah. No. You know, these things here, like you said, Oli, once you start looking into them and you understand them a little bit more and then a lot more, uh, you can see them for what they are. You certainly can. Now, before we head out, because I know I've taken up a lot of your time here and you've been very, very kind and patient with, uh, with the discussion here, what, what, uh, do you think was going on with Austin? Because Austin was different with the bombings. I mean, we didn't have shootings. The Unabomber. Yeah, right, right. So we're, we're like, we're down to like this, uh, this different type of approach. What do you think is going on there? I know for sure that uh, the whole um, manifesto that uh, Ted Kaczynski or whatever his name was, the Unabomber, yeah. what he wrote, there was like 1,500 pages. That exact manifesto with just a few letters uh, and wordings changed here and there was the manifesto of the mass shooter under Spiring Breivik in Norway, more or less copied copy, paste, put together the same. So was the Unabomber the real thing? I have not looked into that case. I would not be surprised at all if he was not. And that we might be able, we might be looking at another innocent individual who is sitting rotting away in prison. But the thing with uh, with these type of things um uh, where suddenly packages becomes lethal or post deliveries become lethal, then we have another problem, problem, reaction, solution, problem, poisoned envelopes, uh, explosives in the envelope. That's a real problem. Reaction. Oh, my God, I need to be scared of that as well. So what is the solutions going to be? And I would very much suggest look out for the solution. They will serve us because there will be um Maybe they will start uh, scanning all kinds of uh, from they might, uh, you know, the post office will be turned into uh, with body scanners or things like yeah, like the airport, the airport. They one of the things I would think they're trying to do is create every single area of society into areas that are for your security uh equipped with body scanners, cameras, uh, you name it. And and do you know, if you, we were talking about these other individuals before and, and cinema uh, figures and so on, if you look at the guy who they claimed have, uh, did the bombings in Austin, who then blew himself up in the end, who does he look like? I tell you, he looks a lot like Harry Potter. Oh, okay. I have to take a closer look at that. I can send you photos where I put them next to each other. It's n it's not identical in any way or form, but it's the same glasses, the same haircut. It's sort of your subconscious. That's where they they want to get to you. And also, uh, one of the things that I react against are uh, is do you know when you see photos of someone? Like for instance, if I take your face. And I, I take an image of your face, then I cut it uh, from in half, from top to bottom. Sorry, I hope it's not too painful. Uh, <laughs> then I copy and paste, and I flip one side uh, horizontal, you know, so that your one face will be uh, the two right sides of your face, 
paste yeah. together. And the other one, I will do the same with the other side. And the two will look quite different because most of us are not symmetrical. You know, we have the things, you know, our mouth is a little up or down or eyebrows or whatever. But when you look at these uh, photos of victims, uh, the first time I discovered it was one of the brothers from the Charlie Hebdo um, shooting where they there was there was just something strange about this guy who is quite bold that his face was so symmetrical. So what I did was when I started looking at it, you know, since I love Photoshop, I started playing around with that. So I found out that it's it's like exactly just they flipped the face and then they added a little birthmark <coughs> on the side and then different ears. But the, sorry, but the face itself perfect. Then you have that was the first time. Then the navy uh, the navy yard shooter, I think in New York, same thing there. Identical, you know, they just flipped it. Then there was a, w a Muslim woman that was accused of uh, being involved in terror attacks in England. Same thing. Then, um, let me see. There's so many of them. And then one of the victims in Austin, <coughs> a black guy, you will see his face. It's very strange. First, you don't really notice. You just, oh, my God, another victim. But then look at the face. And you will see, and I did exactly the same thing. I can send you these photos and you will see, oh, they flipped it again. Many, yeah. many of the victims from 9-11 as well, many of them have, of the photos have been manipulated. Very interesting. I, I tell you around 9-11, it's such a bizarre area to, to get into because the number of victims, it's just very, very strange. The number of people that is said to have been in the, in the towers that day, very, very strange. And I was, I found, um, or oh, somebody sent me a quote from a newspaper from that, the day after where they said it was so strange because there were piles of shoes on the pavement outside the towers where the towers used to be. Piles of shoes. Here we have the shoes again. Yeah. The shoes are very, very, it's, like I said, that's a very obvious calling card. Once you, once you notice it, you cannot not see it in these events. And I think now when so many people are becoming aware of it, now they they changed one of the symbols into bicycles, that there's a crashed, crashed bicycle in the background. Uh, they, they These bicycles have started appearing right, left, and center. I don't know if it's a coincidence. I'm just pointing it out now. Yeah, we'll have to research that. We'll have to research what you know, a bicycle means in uh, in, in Masonic symbology. <laughs> I have, or maybe it's <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's just a, a business card. You know, we we have to regroup here because uh, th yeah. that is what I think is happening when enough of us are po you know pointing light in a certain direction. They need to regroup. They need to redirect, and then. Uh, the good thing with this thing is that the, the secondary operations are most of the time not as well prepared. So we come out like one of these uh, um, pretty cheap ones. When you look at these parcels being delivered by the same company, FedEx, as far as I know, uh, there's no footage whatsoever uh, that I've seen of victims, of crime sites or anything, even though if you listen to um, – what the witnesses say, the neighbors that ran over and said, um, I didn't really notice anything specific. Then uh, I ran over and there were blood, gunpowder, shrapnel, blown up the body parts everywhere. I mean, how can you not really notice anything specific and then you go over there and it's a war zone? Hey, I just I just sent you a link here. Uh, just real quickly, there is a uh, a Freemason cycling club. <laughs> You're kidding me. <laughs> no, it says welcome. I just sent it to you. The link in uh, Skype. So it says welcome to the Freemason cycling club. The Freemason cycling club is comprised entirely of Freemasons who share a passion for cycling. We are also involved in swimming, running, triathlons, and everything in between. If you'd like to join the Freemason cycling club, follow the link to the page on Facebook. So, so I don't know. Maybe the bicycle, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I have you no. Know. 
But did you see money raised by the Freemason Cycling Club grand total? And the color is magenta. Uh, I don't know. But did you see the Freemasons uh, 300 uh, year anniversary in London? Mass, no, I didn't see massive. That. I mean, the thing is that when you ma when you mention mention Freemasons, I think many people say, yeah, but they they don't really exist. Well, they they actually yeah. do. And there's a lot of them, and more or less all of them are from the upper uh, hemispheres of society. It's uh, it's not we the normal people down here. We don't get invited, but it's all all up there. They exist, and people have to understand that secret societies, they're the controllers. So, uh, And you have to really get your head wrapped around that. Well, Oli... We've pushed uh, two hours here. It was a great, <laughs> great conversation. It really was. It was a really good conversation. It was uh, a lot of fun to talk to you, as always. Any parting thoughts or anything else you'd like to talk about? Maybe your website as an example. I would like to say I love transparency. I love truth. And the combination truth and transparency is just absolutely wonderful, wonderful. And I think very few areas in life need secrecy. Uh, out of uh, from the opinion of the normal citizen so all of this secrecy that we have everywhere from governments from agencies from you name it for our protection i would say i would very much like to officially give it the finger and say bogger off stop doing it and i would also suggest you know, like so many people are feeling lonely. One of the reasons is because we close each other out. And these, we do it all the time for our protection. You know, it's always for our protection. Yeah, but what if, well, it's not that many years ago where you could leave your door open. You know, it's not that many years ago that uh, if you live in an apartment block that the, the door down there were open, you know, the entrance door, because you had locks on your own door. But all of these things, they slowly, slowly just lock each other. We lock each other out in the cold so that people can even lie in the street and die freezing to death because the door down there is, is locked and you don't even know it. I used to have, uh, I used to live in, a, in an apartment in a small city. Yes, not a lot of criminality. I don't care. I did not lock my door. <clears throat> and outside, I... Uh, my door, I, I hated the way that s Swedes, and especially the area where, where I grew up, the way they're so f obsessed about money or so fixated about money. I think it's so unsexy, so boring to be like mine, 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 instead of sharing, you know, and have fun and just let it flow. So... Uh, what I did, I had this uh, flower pot and I used to take the coins that from, you know, when I came home and I, I, I threw them in the flower pot. And after a while it was full, it, there was quite a lot in it. So what I did was I put it outside my door on the outside uh, and I just wrote a little note saying, if you need it, if you need some, please take. If you can spare some, please give. Yeah. It stayed there for a year or two going up and down and stuff like that. But I thought wow. that was a beautiful, I loved it until my landlord, I'm sure it was my landlord, he stole the whole flower pot. So, but then again, <laughs> he was the, one of the meanest men I've ever met, but bless him. But uh, that was boring. But up until then, I just say, unlock all of these doors that are not needed. Unlock all of this secrecy. What the hell is going on? Who are you afraid of? and try and live in transparency. I would say my suggestion with government buildings, all doors should be open. In parliaments, all doors should be open. Do you know, like uh, uh, the bookkeeping, all books open. Government, all of these agencies, books open so that anyone at any time can walk in and say, listen, I want to have a look. I'm a citizen in here. I'm paying for you to work for me. I want to have a look if you're up to anything. These things are good. I think transparency is a healthy sign. And there, I, I heard this guy, there was a guy who, who used to squat in Berlin, that, you know, house squatting where you just uh, occupied a house. This was in the old days in Berlin. And he said, 
it was great. You know, they lived for free. They were doing, and suddenly one day, uh, the government had been there and just taken away the doors. And that made them leave the building. They couldn't stay there. And I thought, okay, squatters, no squatters, whatever. I just thought it was a brilliant idea. Take down the doors. There can be no secrets behind it. There can be no take down the doors. Tear down, yep. tear down the walls. I say take down the doors and, <laughs> and transparency. If you have nothing to hide, which governments claim they do not, then have transparency. And also this whole thing with politicians, you know, and the, the wages of these individuals come on. It's absolutely ridiculous. They should actually go on minimum wages or something so that you could see that these people are here because they really care and because they really have an urge to help and so on. Not so that it's a job that, that is inviting for corruption, that is inviting people that are weak in themselves, that it is inviting people that, that uh, don't have a stamina or backbone so that they can stand up against office about corruption. Yeah, transparency is key, Oli, and you know it, it's going to take a shift in the mindset of the people to to understand that we have to have this transparency. The thing that I always call out is take a look at these politicians. They are always protected by by Secret Service, armed enforcement, bulletproof vehicles, and there's a reason why it's like that. It's because they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. They are not doing things on behalf of the people or humanity. And that's why they're protected. They're protected because they have to, because they're up to no good. Basically, that's it. They're scared because they know. Yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> that's the thing, right? So anyway, so uh, yeah, great show, Oli. And lightonconspiracies.com. It is indeed. I've been bombarded here for a while. So uh, an attack from right, left and center. So if anyone would like to support what I'm doing, I would be very, very grateful. It's not so easy being a one man band at times. And so I've got the uh, Patreon, uh, donations, my books. I've got the uh, coup d'etat in slow motion about the assassination of the Swedish prime minister, but also with all the connections into even the JFK assassination, the Iran contrast, an in incredible case. I tell you, incredible case. The biggest and most expensive murder investigation in the world still ongoing called Coup d'etat in slow motion, almost a thousand pages. Then remind me uh, a book about when I took an old bicycle, just wanted to head out in the world and instead ended up in the uh, in Iran during the war uh, between Iran and Iraq. Um, I thought when I went in there that it was a land filled with just with crazy individuals screaming Allah Akbar, but instead I found some absolutely beautiful, beautiful uh, human beings, but in an extremely difficult situation. One died, and then I uh, I did my absolute utmost um, and smuggled one of them out through former Russia, East Germany, up to Sweden, and then we got seven more out uh, over the years. So that is called uh, Shadow of Tears. And then I've got a, a book called Remind Me. It's a small little power book, but it's about how to reboot and reset your mindset so that you can live more um, happy and be able to live under pressure, under threat, whatever. It's a, it's a little ga uh, game manual about how to play the Matrix, I would say. It's, it's just a one-hour read, but it has helped a lot of people, myself included. And then I got a little kid's book called Yolanda Yoga Panda. Truth is uh, one, paths are many. Because I think it's very important to reach uh, the kids at an as an early age as possible, so that uh, their yes and their no can become strong, and that they can be strong, uh, independent individuals that is not easily uh, messed around with. It's uh, I think it's a beautiful little book, and uh, thank God so as many other people as well. Very good, Oli. Very good, and all of that is available. At your website. And on Amazon. And on Amazon. Up until okay. now. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, can I, yeah. can I end with a prayer? Yes, of course. Okay. 
May the entire universe be filled with peace and joy, love and light. May everyone, and especially the ones who heard us, be filled with peace and joy, love and light. May the light of truth overcome all darkness, so victory to that light. Thank you, Oli. It's always an excellent prayer. Thank you so much. And that's a wrap, folks. Yes, that's a wrap. And uh, Oli, you can come back anytime, as you know, and I will work to get this show out as quickly as I can. Um, and again, folks, it's uh, it won't be viewed on YouTube. Uh, it will be on DTube and Mixcloud. So uh, the link in the YouTube trailer will be to DTube and Mixcloud, so you can take a listen. Oli, thank you so much. You're most welcome. And, uh, We'll talk again. Talk soon. And that concludes another Sage of Quay interview, and I hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as I did. Links to my guests' websites and social media are listed in the show notes below. And as always, I'd like to thank everyone for listening and visiting the blog. You can get to the blog by typing in sageofquayradio.blogspot.com or simply head over to our hub website at sageofquay.com. Also, if you get a moment, please visit laboroflovemusic.com to listen to my album, Leaving Dystopia. And remember, live in truth and always serve creation. It's really that simple. See everyone next week. Be safe, enjoy, and God bless.